Hello again, everybody, and welcome to allprophecyfulfilled.com on the World Wide Web. And as I always like to remind you on Facebook and on YouTube, simply All Prophecy Fulfilled. Okay, we are winding down our series, the ABCs of Bible Prophecy. Yes, I promise, me, promise you we are coming to an end here. In fact, just one more concluding segment after this. Uh, these have been in no particular order. I have been laying out some biblical principles or sir, some some interpretive lenses, if you will, to look through when we're considering and uh, trying to figure out this Bible prophecy thing. Um, they have been in no particular order. Uh, had they been, this particular segment probably would have been first and foremost, or at least second in order, uh, because it's so foundational. And I'm going to use that word a lot today, foundational. Uh, indeed, it is. And I'm going to call this the, uh, the message uh, from Moses. Okay, so let me start by saying this. You know, every Sunday, each Sunday, all across the nation, uh, I mean, all across the world, really, uh, preachers uh, are preaching sermons. They're preaching the Word. Uh, and from what source do they preach from? Or from, from where does their preaching material come from? Well, the Bible, you would say, right? Obviously, yeah, no doubt, the Bible. Well, you know, we could actually ask the same thing uh, of the Old Testament prophets and their preaching. You know, that really is, I think, the, the storyline of the Bible in a way. It's, it's a long line of prophets uh, preaching a unified, a consistent uh, message to God's covenant people. Now, sure, I mean, each prophet spoke within their own uh, particular locations and at di different time periods, different situations for different reasons. I get that. That. Uh, but the primary message of the prophets was one ongoing message that they all preached. It was a message that pertained to covenant, the covenant that they were under, the Mosaic covenant. So again, the question is, where did all these, these uh, prophets get their message from? Where did they get their preaching material? Well, I'm going to suggest a very simple answer. The law. And when I say the law, I mean primarily Torah. And when I say Torah, specifically from the five books of Moses, the, the Pentateuch, if you will, the first five books in our Bible. Now, I realized that as time went on, the, the teaching texts, if you will, from which the prophets drew from, it surely must have grown as the message of the prophets was passed along, you know, through oral tradition and even recorded as well, so that the later prophets obviously were aware of what the earlier prophets spoke of. Uh, in other words, the Hebrew scriptures grew. Uh, if that makes sense, over time. And some might even say, or make the point, you say, you know what, Ryan, uh, you know, God himself actually spoke directly to or communicated with some of the prophets. So God was the source uh, of their preaching, you know, preaching material. Well, yeah, I, you know, all those things are true. And I wouldn't disagree with those. But here's really what I'm getting at. I'm going to make a pretty uh, bold claim here. The first five books of Moses, the Torah, specifically and especially Deuteronomy, especially and specifically Deuteronomy 27 through 32, and I'm really going to focus on chapter 32, really serve as the foundational preaching text or the prophetic source for all biblical prophecy. Did you hear that? That was huge. So the first five books specifically, I'm going to say Deuteronomy 27 through 32, serve as the, the foundational preaching text, the prophetic source for all biblical prophecy. So if you ask me what's Deuteronomy 27 through 32 uh, have to do with prophecy? Literally everything. Why? Because literally every Old Testament prophet including Jesus, including the New Testament writers, drew directly from it. Now, 
Honestly, I don't think I would have made this claim two years ago uh, because I certainly didn't recognize the significance of this portion of scripture, not until my friend, Rod MacArthur, some of you are familiar with Rod and his teaching, he opened my eyes to the fact that this portion of scripture, it really serves as uh, uh, the backbone, the foundation, or as Rod likes to put it, the linchpin of Bible prophecy. So you remove that linchpin, what happens? It all falls apart. Okay, in fact, I, I love how uh, Rod put it in one of his presentations. I wrote it down. He says, uh, take away this portion of Scripture. He's speaking of Deuteronomy 28 through 32. And you rob all the prophets of their preaching text. Now, that's quite a, quite a claim, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. So, by the way, if you want to listen to some of Rod's uh, teachings on, on this, he has some fantastic uh, teaching on his SkyDrive. Uh, one is labeled uh, Israel's Final Things. He also has some teaching on the Minor Prophets. You have to find a SkyDrive. Probably the best way to get there or the easiest way to tell you how to get there is uh, go to my website, allprophecyfulfilled.com, and on the Resources Links tabs, you'll find a tab to Rod MacArthur's SkyDrive. Drive or OneDrive, and you'll find his teachings there. Great, great stuff. So, uh, okay, so Deuteronomy 27 through 32. What's going on here? Let me just kind of briefly, briefly cover this. The people are approaching the Promised Land. This is like some 40 years after leaving Egypt, and they're getting close to possessing it. Moses is soon to die, uh, but first he gives a very clear uh, and sobering message to the people by reiterating or reminding them of the terms of the covenant that they have entered or are entering into with God. So in chapter 27, he instructs them, okay, I'm going to tell you something here. Uh, write this law down. He makes it very clear. Uh, chapter 28, a very long detailed chapter of the blessings and the curses of the covenant. We'll talk more about that in a sec. Chapter 29, he reminds them that, you know, by agreeing to the terms, they are again, just like 40 years earlier, they are entering into a covenant uh, being established as his people again that day, he says right here. So in chapter 30, he assures them that all the things, all the blessings, all the curses will come upon them. He guarantees it. They will be scattered. They will go into a ca captivity. But you know what? There will be a gathering. There will be a time of a, uh, a another circumcision, a circumcision of the heart. And with that circumcision and with that gathering will come life. Okay, but it's up to you. You've got life and or death. You've got blessings or cursings. Choose life. Don't choose evil. Choose good. It's up to you. Chapter 31. Uh, Moses tells the people that he's about to die. Uh, and then God tells Moses, you know what? As soon as you uh, die, these people are going to turn around. They're going to play the harlot. Well, Moses turns around and tells them, look, I know that uh, you're going to become utterly corrupt. Uh, and evil is going to befall you when? In the latter days. But you know what? Uh, you have the law as a witness against yourselves. Um, so you are without excuse. In chapter 32, Moses speaks uh, the words of a song. That's interesting uh, to the people. It doesn't say he sang it. It says he, uh, he spoke it. So some call it the song of Moses. So this chapter, man, it, it is fascinating. Uh, this is nothing uh, less than a, a prophetic message uh, from Moses. Moses kind of prophetically looks forward into Israel's future and, and actually sees a particular, a single generation of God's old covenant people, the final generation of God's old covenant people that would come to an end. When? In the latter days, okay, or the last days, the last days or the end of that mosaic uh, age, that, that mosaic covenant age, and that would come to its end along with the people who chose to remain in it. So did you, did you catch that? Do you realize Deuteronomy 32 actually uh, predicts or forecasts the final generation, a crooked and perverse generation, which I'll talk about in a sec, in the last days of the Mosaic Age that would come to their end uh, and bring in a, a new generation of God's new covenant people in Christ, in Messiah. 
Now that by extension, that would include us. So yeah, this is relevant to us. So uh, why is this so important? Why is this so significant? Okay, it's because this section of scripture here that I'm talking about, Deuteronomy 27 through 32, uh, it is this that really establishes the, the basis, I think, for all future prophecy of all future prophets. I mean, this becomes the foundational preaching text from which the prophets draw their message uh, and to which their message is tethered to. They have to have something that their message is tethered to. So let me put it to you this way. If we take away this section of Scripture... What we're doing is we essentially take away the foundation on which Israel's covenant with God, with Yahweh, is built upon. So take away the foundation on which God's covenant with Israel is built upon, and you take away any basis for prophecy, really. So as I've already said, you know, my, my friend uh, Rod uh, puts it, you know, that this linchpin, it literally holds the prophetic scriptures in place. Why? Well, because without it, the, the mission, uh, the message of the prophets becomes a little bit unclear. Their authority is weakened. If they don't have this, Deuteronomy, you know, and specifically 27 through 32, if they don't have this, what basis, on what basis or authority do they hold God's people accountable to the covenant that they agreed to obey? I don't think they can. Uh, in fact, you know what this reminds me of? Uh, do you remember Josiah? He became king when he was like eight years old, right? Re very good king. He did right, <laughs> like David. Uh, do you remember he wanted to restore the temple? And uh, Hilkiah, the priest, he found the book of the law of the Lord by Moses, it says. And when they read it to Josiah, do you remember what he did? He tore his clothes. He was beside himself. Why? Well, because Josiah knew Israel had not kept the words of the covenant and all the promised covenant curses, chapter 27, chapter 28, of the covenant were, were, were surely to fall on them. He knew that. Uh, Second, uh, Second Chronicles 34, uh, 21, he says to Hilkiah, Go and inquire of the Lord for me and for those who are left in Israel and Judah concerning the words of the book that is found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out on us because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord to this according to all that is written in this book. So he had Hilkiah go to a prophet, prophetess and say, okay, is this in fact the case? And she said, yep. Behold, I'm going to bring calamity on this place and all its inhabitants, all the curses that are written in the book which they have just read before the king of Judah. See, she's like, yeah, mm -hmm, that's right. Everything that Moses said is true, and it will come into fruition. Okay, so do you see what's going on there? So, uh, I mean, it's huge, really. Josiah became aware that the, the very first message or the foundational message of Moses was coming into fruition. He saw Deuteronomy 27 and 32 uh, being played out and about to be played out in their history. You see, so often I hear people talking about the last days or the time of the end, and they reference events going around, going on around us today. Or maybe they pull out some verse out of the Old Testament, you know, void of context, and they say, "See, we're living in the in the last days." Uh, but you know what? Whatever it is they're claiming, whatever it is they're saying, it's it never seems to have any connection or relationship whatsoever to the foundation that all prophecy really has to be built on and tethered to the message of Moses, which was the end of the Mosaic age and old covenant Israel in judgment in conjunction with the, I'd say the fulfillment uh, of all the Old Test or Old Covenant uh, hopes and promises to, to Israel, in conjunction with the the beginning or the establishment of a new covenant people, a, the new covenant Israel, if you will, in Messiah. So that's the problem. I think we've attempted to uh, redefine prophecy in such a way that we make it all about us, 
or we, we, we're just trying to make sense out of what's going on in the world around us. Well, that's not uh, exegesis, that's isogesis. You're putting into the scripture something that's not really there. So look, the prophecies uh, of Jesus and the New Testament writers, they were nothing more or nothing less, uh, take your pick, than a reiteration or a confirmation of uh, what all the Old Testament prophets before them had taught and hoped for. So all those Old Testament prophets uh, used the law uh, of the words of Moses as their foundational source. So let me say this. <clears throat> when I say that Deuteronomy 27 through 32 is the, the linchpin of Bible prophecy. Okay, I mean it served as the central message, the template, uh, the broad stroke of prophecy. I'm not saying that this particular uh, passage of scripture within it uh, contains all prophetic subject matter, you know, in detail. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying it, this, it's, it serves as the frame and all future prophecy fits within that framework given by Moses. Okay, now this is really important, so pay attention to this. Um, on this foundation here that Moses laid that I'm talking about, Deuteronomy 27 through 32, within this framework, or maybe it's more like uh, branches kind of springing up uh, out of a stump or, or out of the ground, um, out of this, out of what Moses laid here, there are numerous old Testament prophetic themes that develop, and I think they run like threads, uh, like through the Old Testament, but all of them, and I mean all of them, really originate from, and they're built upon the message of Moses in Deuteronomy. Think about this. I mean, themes such as a remnant, uh, a scattering, and a gathering, or is it regathering? Um, we have judgment. We have a theme of light in darkness, light versus darkness. We have the land. We have a, a coming Messiah. We have an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, uh, circumcision of the heart, uh, resurrection, or, or just life, but resurrection life, uh, inclusion of the nations or, or Gentiles, uh, a rebuilt temple, um, the last days, obviously. Uh, these are all... Uh, prophetic themes that are, are like woven into the message of the prophets. And all of these themes, and I mean all of them, are built upon the original message of Moses. Okay, I'm going to give you a couple examples. Let's go to uh, chapter 32. And I want to just quickly demonstrate. You'll have to go over it yourself. But again, I want to give you a little flavor here. We see the beginning uh, of the development of some of these themes here in 27 through 32. And I'm going to show you here in 32. At least hints of some of these themes um, starting to spring up if you will. Uh, see, that's why it's so exciting when we come to the New Testament. We see Jesus and his apostles. We're seeing these Old Testament prophetic themes come to fulfillment in their day. You know why? Well, it was because it was that exact crooked and perverse generation that Moses said would come. That was the generation they were living in. So remember, in chapter 28, it's, it's this, this uh, big, long chapter of the blessings and cursings of, of the covenant. You know, he says in uh, verse 15, it's going to come to pass that if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all his commandments and his statutes, which I command you today, that all these curses will come upon you in overtake you. And he gets very detailed, very redundant actually, because time and time again, we see uh, verses or phrases like this, the Lord will send on you cursing, confusion, rebuke in all that you set your hand to, uh, to do until you are destroyed and until you perish. Verse 21, until he has consumed you. Verse 22, until you perish. Verse 24, until you are destroyed. Uh, verse 45, until until you are destroyed. And it just keeps going and going and going. Verse 48, verse 51, verse 61. Until you are destroyed. Bring you to nothing. In uh, verse 64, what's, what's God going to do? He will scatter you. Um, so again, we see that, that prophetic theme of a scattering begin to develop. 
let's take a look here. I know I'm running out of time here. There's so much to be said here. In, in chapter 30, uh, we have here, you know, again, the Lord your God will bring you to the land. It's interesting. With the land is, is this association of covenant life, life in the land. It's as if uh, when you come into the land, that is where the life is at. And I think that is a, a beginning of a de de the development of the theme of life, resurrection life, being raised up into covenant life. Uh, he says in verse uh, 6 of chapter 30, And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. Hey, there's living. There's life. How are you going to live? Well, I think you're going to be resurrected to covenant life with God. So again, these themes are slowly uh, being uh, mentioned and they will be developed by later prophets. Okay, let's get to chapter 32 real quick. Chapter 32, verse 5. This is pretty interesting because Moses, speaking to God's covenant people right there, it's as if he turns his attention to uh, people right in front of him and a future generation because he starts using they. They have corrupted themselves. They are not his children. Why? Because of their blemish. He says he refers to them, this they, as a perverse and crooked generation. Well, <clears throat> in, in verse 20, he says to this particular generation, he says, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end will be. You see, there's an end in sight of this particular people. He says, for they are a perverse generation. Now, I don't know if you know this or not, but nowhere in the Bible ever again uh, in Scripture is there a reference to a wicked or a crooked and perverse generation, not until when? we get to the New Testament. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Well, it is interesting, but I think it's pretty obvious that Moses is looking forward to this particular generation, this New Testament generation, that will be the pivotal, the terminal generation, if you will. He says, uh, for example, Paul says in Philippians 2.15, um, so that you, speaking to that first century church, may be blameless and pure, children of God, without fault in a crooked and perverse generation. Acts 2.4, Peter tells them to be saved from this perverse generation. Jesus himself referred to his generation as a wicked or a perverse, crooked and perverse generation. In verse 21 of uh, 32, it's interesting that uh, he says, They have provoked me to jealousy by, by what is not God. They have moved me to anger by their foolish idols. But I will provoke them to jealousy by those who are not a nation. Now, hold on a second. Here we have the entrance or the idea of uh, another nation provoking or other nations provoking this particular people, God's covenant people, to jealousy. Did you know that Paul cites this verse right here in Romans chapter 10, and he, he uses this verse and applies it to his particular ministry that was going on in, in Paul's day? Interesting, eh? <laughs> in verse 29, uh, he says, Oh, that they were wise, that they understood this, that they would consider their latter end. There's the latter days theme uh, continuing on. In verse 32, he says, For their vine is the vine of Sodom and the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall. Their clusters are better. Their, their wine is the poison of serpents. Do we see elsewhere in Scripture this idea of, of Israel as a vine and perhaps a vine uh, or a vineyard not producing uh, good grapes, if you will? Yeah, we sure do. How about Isaiah chapter 5, I think it is. Do you think Isaiah might have been aware of this text? I bet you he was. In fact, I'd be willing to bet that he actually uh, uh, took from this particular text, if you will. Uh, what else do we have? Uh, verse 35, verse 36. Again, vengeance and judgment on his people. That is a central theme 
in the prophetic scriptures. Uh, verse 39, this is, I find this extremely fascinating. Verse 39, it says, Now see that I, even I, am he, and there is no God beside me. Listen to this. He says, I kill and make alive. I wound and I heal. Hmm, make alive? That almost sounds like a resurrection concept, doesn't it? Do you think, I mean, have you heard something like that elsewhere from another prophet? I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. How about Hosea chapter 6? Incidentally, that is, a, that is a passage of scripture, Hosea chapter 6, that Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 3, I think it is, that he rose the third day according to the scriptures. Well, where is that found? Hosea chapter 6. Wow, so many connections. How about uh, verse 43? Read, Rejoice, O Gentiles, his people. There's no wit there, by the way. Rejoice, O Gentiles, his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants and render vengeance on his adversary. He will provide atonement for his land, his people. Not his land and his people, his land, his people. People, isn't this interesting that he refers to uh, the, the Gentiles as his people after the rendering of vengeance or along with the avenging of the blood of his servants? Sounds like Matthew 23 to me. And catch this, providing atonement for his land, his people. I guess my question is, as I, I quickly run through all these, and I know that was kind of a, you know, like, like I always like to say, that was kind of like drinking from a fire hose. That was a lot to take in. But do you see some familiar Old Testament themes starting to uh, sprout out, if you will, uh, of the Song of Moses? I bet you do. I, and you know what? I'm certain all the prophets did too. And that's really my point. If we would simply begin our study of the prophets, I think with this as a first step, taking a look at the, the message from Moses, and then I think we need to remain tethered to it. Uh, we need to build on it. We need to continue to view the prophets' mission and their ministry through the lens of Deuteronomy 27 through 32. And I think if we did that, I think we would better understand the bigger picture of uh, the panorama of redemptive history as we study it and as we see it unfold in the scriptures. So the Old Testament prophetic themes that I've been speaking of, these things run all the way through the scriptures uh, like threads, all the way through the redemptive narrative. And where do they begin? And that's what I'm trying to tell you. Right here, we see the beginning of these themes uh, being formulated in this section of Scripture, uh, along with the, the covenant cursings and the blessings and the Song of Moses in chapter 32. So what I'm saying is this. If your understanding of prophecy is void uh, of the framework and the understanding uh, of the books of Moses, specifically this portion of Scripture that I was sharing today, um, then you're not understanding biblical prophecy as defined by the Bible itself. So I would invite you, please consider the message of Moses. I think it's foundational to our understanding of Bible prophecy. So, all right, that was a mouthful. I hope you absorbed uh, some of that, most of that. Questions, comments, all that, uh, welcome. Uh, we'll talk to you next go around. Thanks for watching, folks. I really do appreciate it. Uh, we'll, we'll catch you later. Bye-bye.